Empires throughout history have understood the simple rule that the more land you control, the more natural resources you potentially have at your disposal. The leaders of the Soviet Union understood this when they embarked on a massive industrialization campaign in the late 1920s. Joseph Stalin and his comrades in the Politburo knew that in order to achieve the goal set out in their first five-year plan, they would need to find substantial deposits of bauxite for aluminium production and iron ore for steelmaking, along with copper, nickel and other important metals. The only question was where to start digging. The USSR controlled one-sixth of the world's landmass, but little was known about the mineral resources located under the surface of its vast territories. Mineral exploration had been a feature of Tsarist Russia since 1882, when Alexander III decreed the formation of a geological committee. But these early efforts were poorly funded, and by the time of the Bolshevik Revolution and the formation of the Soviet Union in 1917, only 10% of the country's geology had been mapped, and only a handful of large-scale mines had been developed. The Geological Committee took on a new lease of life under its Soviet rulers, who basically gave it a blank check for geological mapping and mineral exploration. Although the exact amount of expenditure isn't known, it's estimated the USSR spent around 1 billion rubles on prospecting and exploration in 1936 alone, the equivalent of US $870 million at the time, or more than $18.3 billion today. The motivation for these efforts wasn't only practical, it had a strong ideological basis too. One of the Communist Party's overarching goals was a complete reconstruction of what it saw as a chaotic social order, and it was easy to draw a connection between this and the goal of bringing order to nature. In the Soviet worldview, nature was senseless unless it served human purposes. The colonization of nature, therefore, became one of the pathways to what the state ideology viewed as the forming of a new Soviet man. It had taken more than six centuries for the Russian Empire to expand from its humble beginnings in Muscovy in around 1300 to its full territorial extent on the eve of the Soviet takeover in 1917, when it stretched from Eastern Europe to the Pacific Ocean and from the Arctic Sea down to the Caucasus and Central Asia. The Soviet leadership understood that if they were to have any hope of accomplishing their goals, they would need to colonize the mineral resources of these territories much more quickly. And they turned to the thing they knew how to do best, propaganda for help. Throughout the Soviet era, state ideology placed geologists onto the same pedestal as cosmonauts and pilots. Poems and songs glorified the profession, describing geologists in such terms as the brothers of wind and sun. Young people were urged to throw their energy into going on expeditions to master the land. In the beginning, the USSR suffered from a lack of trained geologists, but thanks to these propaganda efforts, it had up to 12,000 geologists in 1937 and 120,000 by 1984. In the 1950s, it was estimated that the Soviet Union had half of all the geologists in the world. Work in the field wasn't always as glamorous as the propaganda made it out to be. Posted far from civilization, for up to eight months at a time, members of these geological expeditions would encounter hazards like hunger, freezing temperatures, and even bears. In the early years, they carried only basic equipment. Tools that would have made it easier to identify mineral resources, such as drilling, were simply too expensive and impractical. Therefore, these early expeditions turned to the same resource the Soviets always turned to when lacking for other means, manpower, with the armies of geologists joined by prisoners from gulag camps for physically demanding work, and by members of the NKVD who were there to guard the prisoners for logistical support. The exploration teams also learned to harness what they came to call geological imagination, which involved assembling findings on the basis of incomplete and ambiguous evidence. For example, they would observe that particular minerals often appeared in rock samples in the same sequence, a technique known in modern times as mineral association which geologists around the world still sometimes use today. Thanks to their early expeditions, the development of mineral resources over a 15 year time span far surpassed anything formally achieved in a like period in the world's history, according to a report by the British geologist David Williams in the scientific paper Nature in 1942. Skeptics may doubt the validity of some of the Russian estimates of ore reserves, Williams wrote, but it should be recalled that vast territories still await detailed investigation and the actual resources might well prove to exceed those now claimed. Indeed, by 1952, after easier access to modern exploration tools that helped to confirm many of the mineral resources, the USSR was producing 
28% of all the world's gold, ranking second behind the Union of South Africa, 17% of steel, second to the United States, 14% of nickel, second to Canada, 12% of aluminium, third to the US and Canada, 11% of copper, fourth to the US, Chile and Northern Rhodesia, today known as Zambia, and 11% of silver, fourth to Mexico, the US and Canada. By 1973, the Soviet Union boasted 40% of global iron ore reserves and a substantial share of the reserves of many other metals. Same year, the New York Times reported that the United States was experiencing raw material shortages for the first time in its history, while the Soviet Union was hoping to become a mineral exporter for the first time in its history. The problem for the Soviets was that two out of every three known mineral deposits were being left in the ground due to a shortage of capital and technology to develop them into mines. And so, the Soviets argued at the time, the West should provide money and technical expertise in exchange for raw materials and peaceful coexistence. History shows this peaceful coexistence never eventuated. The USSR collapsed in 1991, in part because the same propaganda system that gave rise to such incredible feats as the Mineral Archipelago could no longer hide atrocities like the Gulag Archipelago, and also because the system a brute force that gave the Soviets a temporary edge in mining and other industrial activities could not sustain what under the surface was a completely broken economy. The Soviet Union is long gone, but the legacy of this unparalleled period of mineral exploration lives on in the archives of its 15 former republics. In these archives, one can find treasures like a series of enormous maps showing all the geological formations of the entire territory of the former Soviet Union. The first complete geological map was published in 1956 at a scale of 1 to 2.5 million, and it garnered a lot of international attention, due both to its magnitude and the fact this type of insight into the USSR had not previously been available. More editions were published over the years, including the one shown on screen, which is from 1975. This incredible geological knowledge base assisted in the discovery of more than 20,000 mineral deposits during the Soviet epoch and may contain clues to the locations of thousands of still undiscovered deposits. Many Soviet mines are still in operation today, and some former members of the USSR still boast large mining sectors. For example, Russia is the world's biggest producer of diamonds, second biggest producer of gold, and third biggest producer of nickel, as well as potash, a critical ingredient in fertilizers. Belarus is the world's fourth biggest potash producer, and Kazakhstan produces 45% of all the world's uranium. But to a large degree, the ex-Soviet states have failed to realize the full economic potential of their mineral resources. And that's problematic, given that, with the exception of the Baltic states, most of these countries are well below global averages for important social and economic indicators, such as average per capita income and life expectancy. And while there is no silver bullet, mining of raw materials that are in high demand worldwide could give these countries an economic boost. The reasons for the lack of mine development are actually pretty similar to the reasons the Soviets struggled to develop mines in the latter years of the USSR. In most of these countries, the laws are still too geared towards protecting the state's interests and don't do enough to incentivize private investment. In an extreme case, the Kyrgyz government recently seized the country's largest gold mine from its Canadian owner after having threatened to do so for the best part of the decade. If you want to scare off foreign investors and damage your economy, that's a pretty good way to go about it. In a recent video, I showed how Botswana became an economic success by creating a stable political and legal environment which facilitated foreign investment in its giant diamond deposits. The ex-Soviet states could follow the same road mapping theory, and if they do, they have an added advantage that most other countries can only dream of. A treasure trove of geological data showing investors exactly where to set up their mine operations. I'm the Dove for Mining the World. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe for more content, and wherever you are in this mineral-rich world of ours, Thank you.